Good morning. Good morning. I was just waiting to make sure that Tim had stopped ringing the bell. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to Salem Lutheran Church, whether you're with us here live or whether you're with us here on live stream. It's uh, good to have you here with us for worship. Uh, I just have a couple of quick announcements. Uh, today we're going to do a new member welcome. And we were supposed to have two, uh, Sharon Salmon, who is sitting way in the back. I told her that rather than have somebody come forward and with all the COVID stuff going on, I'm just going to have her stand in the pew where she is when we do that. You will have to turn around and stare at her so you can get to know Sharon a little bit. Uh, she was supposed to have been accompanied by Velda Cross, who is also becoming part of our happy family. But Velda contacted me this past week and said that she didn't think she'd make it because she was exhibiting symptoms of COVID. And rather than take the chance, she could not get tested. So she said, I'm just going to quarantine myself and stay home. And I said, well, we'll just do it another time. So we're going to keep uh, Velda in our prayers today also. And pray that God gives her, it's not, first of all, that it's not COVID. And secondly, that if it is, that she does well and joins us again really soon. So with that bit of introduction, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Let us confess now our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those you called us to welcome. Accept our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us that we may bathe in the glory of your Son born among us and reflect your love for all creation. Amen. Rejoice in this good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High, adopted into the household of Christ, and inheritors of eternal life. Live as freed and forgiven children of God. Amen. We continue our worship with the singing of our first hymn, O Morning Star, How Fair and Bright, if you'd like to follow along with the music, it's in the red hymnal, number 308.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Lord God, source of every blessing, you showed forth your glory and led many to faith by the works of your Son, who brought gladness and salvation to his people. Transform us by the spirit of his love, that we may find our life together in him, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. We hear God's word. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 62, 1 through 5. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn 
and your salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land merry, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be merry. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11. Now concerning spirit gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit of the common good. To one is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one spirit to another the workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the spirit chooses. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. gospel for this Sunday comes from the gospel of St. John in the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. I always, when we start a, a new gospel, I always like to sort of tell you a little bit about it. Uh, and John, I think, is an interesting gospel. He's one of the longer gospels. I'm not sure if he's the longest, but he comes pretty close to being the longest gospel. Uh, he's also what I call the maverick gospel. When we talk about the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, we always talk about, first of all, the synoptics, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're called the synoptics because they basically tell the same stories in the same sequence. There's variations. Some include some, some don't include others. Some stories are a little different than others. But basically, they tell the same story in the same sequence. John is different. Uh, I always said it's almost like John had all the other gospels sitting in front of him because we do think John was the last gospel written. And that he read them and said, hey, pretty good stories, but you forgot a lot of stuff. And so John fills in a lot of things that the other gospel writers don't tell us about. One of the things, for instance, John is the one that tells us the most of what happened in that upper room before they went off to the Garden of Gethsemane. The other gospel writers just kind of brush over it. John goes into great detail. But anyways, here today we have a story from very early in the ministry of Jesus. Uh, this is the second chapter. And he tells us about the first miracle that Jesus performed. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you or to me? My hour is not yet come. 
His mother then said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come before you this day, first of all, giving thanks to you for your blessings and for all the love that you pour down upon us each day of our lives. O oh Lord, as we have now here gathered with our brothers and sisters, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds to your word, that we may hear and learn, as in his name we pray. Amen. You know, when I, when I first read this gospel lesson, a very familiar gospel lesson, very, very familiar story, uh, a lot of interesting thoughts went through my mind. Uh, and as soon as I saw that lesson, uh, the, actually the first thing that popped into my mind was uh, my daughter's wedding. Uh, my daughter got married, how long ago has it been now? Maybe about five, six years? Can't remember exactly when. Uh, but it was about six years ago, and I kept thinking to myself as I read that story, I wonder if Jesus does catering, because that would have made it so much simpler if I would have had him, especially the wine part. Boy, that would have been really cheap, you know, could have saved a lot on the wedding bill. I was amazed, you know, I, my daughter got married after my wife had passed away, and so a lot of the stuff fell, that would have gone to mom to help daughter get ready for the wedding fell upon dear old dad, but... I really had a blast doing it. Uh, I remember the first thing, I was up in uh, D.C. with my daughter, uh, helping her start making plans for the wedding. And of course, the first thing she had to decide on is the wedding dress, right? Couldn't believe how much I spent for a wedding dress. <laughs> you know. But she took me out with her, and it was really a lot of fun. We, she tried on all the different dresses, and finally she, she picked the one she liked. And it was so much different than all the others, and uh, I said, how come you picked that one, Jen? Because it was so much different than all the others, and a little old-fashioned looking, actually. And she said, well, when I walked out wearing it, I could see in, the, in your face that this was the right dress to buy. And she says, why did you like it so much, Dad? I said, because it reminded me a lot of your mother's. So that that's, was that. But I remember Doris, when Doris and I got engaged, and she had to go out and, and get ready for the wedding. She got a wedding dress, but her mom, we were living in St. Louis at that time, and her mom came down from South Dakota to St. Louis to go out shopping with Doris. And Doris f went shopping at J.C. Penney's. That's where she bought her dress, a dress I still have, by the way. And I don't know, I think that marriage lasted okay with the J.C. Penney dress, but it's a different time and different, different places. So my daughter got this great, big, beautiful wedding dress that cost more money than, I think, the entire wedding for Doris and I cost. And then, of course, she had to have an outdoor wedding, and we had, so we found uh, the uh, uh, Worcester Inn. And be, if you remember, behind that, they used to have this outdoor pavilion. And we rented that out and did the wedding there. And, and then, of course, it was all the drinks you want and all the food you want. And, I kept thinking as I read this story, gee, I wish Jesus would have done the catering because I probably, like I said, could have saved a lot of money, but I didn't think he'd be too expensive, would he? <laughs> but as I looked at this lesson, I, I eventually put that out of my head because I thought, you know, there are really several directions with this, this gospel lesson that you can go. I mean, I could talk, first of all, about this story. It's simply a, a miracle story that shows to us how Jesus is truly the all-powerful God. He has the power over elements. He can take simple water and turn it into wine. In fact, as I was saying that, I ever, anyone ever seen the Da Vinci Code? Yeah, you remember at the end of the movie 
when the girl finally realizes she is a descendant of Jesus Christ and she's talking to the Tom Hanks character and she starts walking away she uh, goes up to this little pool of water and she puts her foot down on top of it like she's gonna walk on it and of course her foot goes into the water and then she looks at Tom Hanks and says I don't know maybe I should just try the the wine thing first so I, I thought of that when I read this too, you know, yeah, maybe, you know, I could talk about that because that's a miracle. Not every day somebody can turn water into wine. And I could go off on, on that kind of a sermon that would emphasize the power and the majesty of God who can do all things, take simple water, turn it into the best wine. And not just wine, but the best wine. Did you pick that up in the story where the steward says, you know, most of the time people serve the good wine first and the bad wine later, the cheaper wine later, why? Because after you had the good wine and gotten a little too much to drink, you may not be able to tell the difference between bad wine and good wine. So that's when you save some money. And the steward says, this wine is the best wine. It's great wine. So that's one way we could have gone. On the other hand, I could also talk about the fact that Jesus chose to do his first wedding or his first miracle at a wedding reception. I mean, when you look at the ministry of Jesus and you listen to him talking about what heaven is like, more often than not, the image that he chooses to explain heaven and what it's like is a marriage feast, a banquet. Why? Well, I think when you think about it, what, is a, what happens at a wedding reception? All the people that are closest to you and most dear to you, why well, they're invited, family members, close friends, people that are important to you, they're all there. On top of that, it's a real party. I remember my daughter's wedding. I was dancing with all the guests until probably midnight, and then everybody sort of left. But it was fun, I had a blast. It was a good time. Food was really good, top drawer. It's a wonderful time and a wonderful place to celebrate. That's what marks a wedding feast. So it's natural that Jesus would say, that's what heaven is like. Heaven is like going to a banquet feast where the best food and drinks are served, and guess what? You don't gain an ounce. You can eat all you want and not gain an ounce. Boy, that'd be heaven to me. But then, you know, what thought kept going through my mind after that is why would Jesus care? I mean, seriously. Why would Jesus care? if they ran out of wine at this wedding reception. I mean, oh, I understand that the bride and groom would probably care. I understand why the family of the bride and groom would care. I mean, have you ever been at a wedding feast where they ran out of food or drink? Have you ever been? Seriously. Yeah, I was at one. I was the pastor who performed the wedding. They had me sitting at the second last table to be served. And when they got to our table, there was no food. I was not a happy camper. So Doris and I left and we stopped at McDonald's on the way home. Yeah, I remember that, I remember that wedding very... I, so I understand why some people would really care about that. You know, because what a disaster it can become. For years, people would be talking about, were you at so-and-so's wedding? Yeah, I was there. That's the one where they ran out of food. Never forget a wedding like that. So I understand why the family at this wedding feast would have cared. You don't want to end up at that kind of a wedding. So I understand why the bride or groom or the families or the, of the bride and groom might care, but why would Jesus care? I mean, didn't he have bigger things to worry about? More important things to carry about? I mean, isn't this the God who set planets on their courses, who created the heavens and the earth and all that is in it? This is the God who came down to engage in that cosmic battle between good and evil? This is the God who came to defeat sin, death, and the power of the devil? This is the God who came to give his life on the cross so that we could have life eternal? Wouldn't you think a wedding reception and running out of wine would be a little bit down on his list of things to do? And yet in this story, we see Jesus taking time out to turn jugs of water into wine so that the wedding reception was a great success. Why are we being told this story? You know, I'm always struck with that question. Why, are we, why is this story in the gospel? 
You know, there's an interesting thing John says at the end of his gospel. He says, if everything Jesus said or did was written down, there wouldn't be enough books in all the world to contain it. But what is written is written that you might know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. What that means is the gospel writers made decisions. They didn't tell us everything Jesus said. They didn't tell us everything Jesus did. They were selective. There was a reason why they picked the stories they told and omitted the ones that weren't told. Why was this one included? Why did they tell this story? Why does John tell us this story? I think that we are being told that this story is included so that we could understand that for God, anything that affects us, anything that impacts our life, that is not beneath our God. He turns his attention to that. You know, it was in 1 Peter that we are told, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Even the mundane things in your life are important to God. It doesn't just say, cast the important stuff, the earth-changing stuff, the earth-shattering stuff. It says, cast your care upon him, the big stuff that can change the world. It doesn't say that. It says, cast all your care. It doesn't say, take a vote on what's important in life and then cast that on Jesus. It says, cast all your care upon him. Everything, anything. There is nothing so small Nothing so insignificant that he doesn't care about it. And why is that true? Because he cares for you. I'm not sure that Jesus really cared about the kind of wine that was to be served at that wedding in Cana or, or the quality of that wine. But I do think that he cared about those people, just like he cares about you and me. So the moral of the story is if you have something that's weighing you down, if there's something that has given you a sleepless night, if you have a worry that you just can't let go of, cast your care upon him. Give it to Jesus. Because he really cares for you. You know, I used to tell people in counseling, always to focus on the things you can control. Too often I find people focusing on things they have no control over. So I always would tell people in counseling, Focus on the things you can control. Everything else, give to Jesus. Cast your care upon him. Give it to Jesus because he really cares for you. He cares about your problems. He cares about your worries, your concerns. Why? Because he cares for you. You are important to him. I will leave you with this uh, simple poem that I've always kept a copy of. There is a place for my broken dreams, disappointment, defeat, and loss. I will take my tears as an offering of love to the Savior who suffered my cross. May God lift your spirits up if something is weighing on you today, may he take that from your shoulders and help you look to a new day. Amen. We continue our service with a singing of an old kind of epiphany song. As with gladness, men of old, it's in the red hymnal if you want to follow along the music, number 302.
Please be seated. Except for Sharon. <laughs> Sharon, stand up. If you don't know who Sharon is, turn around. There, that's Sharon. Sharon Sammons, who is coming to be a part of our happy little family. And so, dear friends, we give thanks for the gift of baptism and for this person, one with us in the body of Christ, whom we welcome as a new member into the life and the ministry of this congregation. Sharon has transferred her membership to Salem this past year. And at this time, we will welcome her and install her as a new member in faith here at Salem Lutheran Church. Now with the whole church, first let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now in baptism, we are welcomed into the body of Christ and sent to share in the mission of God. We are called to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, to serve all people following the example of Jesus, and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Our beloved sister Sharon in Christ, do you intend to continue in the covenant of your baptism among God's people in this place? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help and guide me. Now, I ask, like to ask everyone else to stand up. And now I want you all to turn around and look at Sharon. You can turn your back to me. No pressure here, Sharon. All right. And I ask you now, people of God, do you promise to support and pray for this new member in her life in Christ? If so, answer, we do, and we ask God to help and guide us. So let us welcome this sister in Christ to this community of faith. We rejoice with you in the life of baptism. Together we will give thanks and praise to God and proclaim the good news to all the world. We give you thanks for our new member, Sharon, whom you have drawn to yourself by the love of Jesus Christ and whom we have welcomed into this household of faith. Keep us close together in your spirit, in the breaking of bread and the prayers, and in service to others. Amen. You can turn around and face me now. <laughs> okay. And, you know, we're glad, Sharon. We're happy to have you with us. So bring joy to this congregation as we hope we bring joy to you. And we look forward to Velda's watching us on live stream. Velda, we're sorry you couldn't be here. Because we're not live. Well, if she somehow hears this, we miss you, Velda, and we wish you well, and we hope you'll be back with us soon. Uh, anyways, with that, we continue our worship service with the prayers of the church. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance, so we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your Spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children pray. Send, send us love, send us power, send us grace. 
by your spirit, activate within your church gifts of faith, healing, and prophecy. Unite those who profess your name across congregations, denominations, and geographic boundaries. Open our hearts to recognize and celebrate surprising miracles. Your creation reflects your generosity. Bless farmers, migrant farm workers, orchard keepers, ranchers, and all who tend the abundance of the land. Protect food and water sources from destruction that all can eat and drink and be satisfied. By your spirit, grant wisdom, knowledge, and discernment to those who hold leadership positions at any level. Direct policy makers toward compassionate decisions that build up safe and just communities. Lead all authorities in seeking and serving the common good. Hear us, O oh God. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. As Jesus provided generously in a moment of need, provide generous gifts of healing for those in need this day, especially Barbara, Monica, Lynn, Calvin, Marion, Jean, Tony, family of Sharon, Andy and his family, family of Zachary, Bill, Robert, Cliff, and George, and those we now name aloud or in our hearts. Provide abundantly for all who are hungry or thirsty, all seeking shelter, and all who seek peace. You see us for who we are, and you delight in us. Embrace those struggling with self-worth, wrestling with self-identity, or facing significant life transition. Remind us that nothing can separate us from your love. You bless us through the spiritual gifts of the saints who have gone before us. We give thanks for the life of Martin Luther King Jr. and all who have modeled the way of courageous faith. Hear us, O oh God. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love. Send us power, send us grace. Since we have such great hope in your promises, O oh God, we lift these and all our prayers to you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Let's share that peace with one another. Thank you for joining us this Sunday for our Sunday live stream service. This is the time that we will be passing the offering plate. I encourage you to make a contribution to St. Lutheran Church either by check or by using our PayPal button that is found on our slcw.org website. Thank you in advance, and I now return you to our service.
seeds that were sown that we may be fed with the bread of life. Gather the hopes and the dreams of all, unite them with the prayers we offer now. Grace our table with your presence and give us a foretaste of the feast to come. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, sovereign of the universe. You offer us new beginnings and guide us on our journey. Lead us to your table. Nourish us with this heavenly food and prepare us to carry your love to a hungry world. In the name of Christ, our light. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, Open to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. We praise you for the grace shown to your people in every age, the promise to Israel, the rescue from Egypt, the gift of the promised land, the words of the prophets, and at this end of all the ages, the gift of your Son, who proclaimed the good news in word and deed, and was obedient to your will, even to giving his life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And therefore, O oh God, with this bread and cup, we remember the life our Lord offered for us. 
and believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we who share in Christ's body and blood may live to the praise of your glory and receive our inheritance with all your saints in light. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. We now join our prayers with those of your servants of every time and every place and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all. And so through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now the gifts of God for the people of God. The world have mercy on us. And now take and eat, for this is the body of Christ. Take and drink, this is the blood of Christ. And now may this body and blood Strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us rise in prayer. We give you thanks, gracious God, for we have feasted on the abundance of your house. Send us to bring good news and to proclaim your favor to all. Strengthen with the richness of your grace in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now receive the blessings of our Lord. God, who leads you in pathways of righteousness, who rejoices over you and who calls you by name, bless your going out and your coming in today and forever. Amen. And now we conclude our service with our sending hymn, Jesus, come for we invite you. Uh, it's 312 in your hymnals. Thank mm -hmm. you.
I want to thank you for coming to share this moment with me here in worship. God's blessings keep you safe and strong until we meet again. And I hope it keeps you safe, especially if we're going to get eight inches of snow tonight. So, and if anybody feels the urge to plow out an extra driveway, uh, I'd be happy to accommodate you. Uh, anyways, I hope also, even though I know we have all the protocols in place for COVID, and we got to be careful. But I hope you'll find some way as you leave church to say hi to Sharon and to welcome her here at Salem and to say that we all look forward to working with her in God's kingdom for many, many years to come. So God's blessings on you, Sharon. Welcome to Salem. It's good to have you part of us. I've seen your name on the uh, live stream list many times, but I've, I don't have ever seen your face, and I guess I'm going to have to wait a little longer for that with the mask. So. <laughs> I just find it amazing. I run into people all the time who walk up to me and say, well, hi, Pastor, and I have no idea who they are, you know. And they'll pull the mask out a little bit and say, oh, <laughs> there you go, Sharon, good to see you. <laughs> but I hope you'll find a way to say welcome to Sharon as you leave church today. Until we meet again, go with Christ into a weary world, share the good news. <laughs>